Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. I want to again thank you for joining uh, this webinar, and I hope it becomes very informative for you. Uh, what I want to first cover, if you look at the agenda, is the interference overview, uh, interference types, uh, radio propagation, as well as interference hunting. And then my colleague Chinton will cover the C-Wave interference locating system that TCTEL has. So to begin with the interference overview, I first want to define what interference is. And interference is an unwanted RF signal that's caused by various electronic sources, including harmonics, that negatively affect mobile communications. And this can be either internal interference, what we call co-channel or adjacent channel interference, or it could be external interference, which is really what the focus of this uh, webinar is. And to answer the question of what frequencies are most affected by interference, well, interference can really affect all frequencies, all mobile bands. But it is a much larger issue, typically, for lower frequencies in the 300 and 900 megahertz range because of the way RF propagates at these frequencies and also because of the typical types of interference sources that might be causing this external interference, which I'll be getting into in the next few slides. So moving on to the next slide, the effects of interference. Well, there are both technical effects and there are business effects. And the technical effects are video pixelation, which you see on the right-hand side of the slide in that picture. And it's probably actually quite common if you have HDTV. You might see this type of uh, pixelation, particularly if you see any storm system or rain system moving into the area. It will also have the effect of poor voice quality dropped calls or sessions if you have a data session. It'll also cause very low data throughput as well as a latency due to retransmission if you're working on the data link. But the business effects can be even more which can result in customer churn. And customer churn really is caused by many things but one of them is really and a major one is the poor quality of service that a customer might experience in the network. So if interference is causing uh, poor quality of service it can have a real business effect and affect your uh, customer loyalty to your network. So when is the best time really to test for interference? Well, it's really all the time, but there are really two major reasons why you test for interference. First would be spectrum clearing, when you have new or refarmed spectrum when it becomes available. Uh, you must clear both the uplink and downlink before you actually want to turn up the network. And with the FCC periodically releasing new spectrum, or whether you're farming frequencies from uh, other uh, technologies such as GSM or CDMA or uh, EBDO, uh, whenever you do this refarming, you want to clear up that spectrum again uh, because a lot of interference can crop up while that network is in service that you might not be aware of. And the other time is in-service interference. Uh, testing, which affects the quality of service of a live network. And I'll get into details more on what you want to test when you're in an in-service network on the next few slides. So when it comes to in-service testing of mobile networks, uh, typically what's tested is the uplink because uh, you essentially find that you have interference either one of two ways. One, is you look at the base station KPIs which report interference levels above a quality affecting level at the base station. Often it's uh, in the neighborhood of minus 102 to minus 105 dBm. So if you see that type of uh, interference coming into the base station, you might want to start checking on where that interference is actually originating from. The other reason is customers may be reporting problems in certain areas. Uh, Uplink interference is actually more sensitive to interference because of the mobile transmission restrictions. Uh, because of the UE is limited on what power it can actually transmit in the uplink, which is 23 dBm. Uh, it doesn't take sometimes a lot of external interference to cause a problem on the uplink that the base station might be seeing. In addition to that, new sources of interference are continually being generated. 
In some cases, when I talk to operators, they see new interference uh, popping up in their uh, area of interest every few days or every week. On the downlink side, you can also have interference. However, it's not as common because it's usually masked by the extremely powerful signal coming from the LTE base station. So consequently, uh, downlink testing is not done very often. However, in the case of uh, passive intermodulation, uh, this can be a reason why downlink uh, might be tested actually in service. Since this can actually cause, uh, it can be very powerful and cause interference in your downlink, leading to uh, customer dissatisfaction. So now I want to move on to what the interference mechanisms actually are. They're very, and I, what I kind of did is categorize what the interference types are. You can have modulated sources, you can have unmodulated sources, uh, harmonics, passive intermodulation, which is uh, also known as PIM, uh, repeaters or bidirectional amplifiers, BDAs, as well as uh, intentional interference. So to get a little more in detail in each one of these types of uh, interferers, we're going to start off with modulated sources. And these are actually devices that are intended to transmit RF signals. And what can happen is you can have unwanted interference that actually comes from these devices when they're malfunctioning or if they're operated in an improperly uh, manner, an improper manner. Uh, typically these are usually narrowband signals. Uh, they can come from two-way radios, they can come from other mobile towers, they can come from access points. And even compliant RF transmitters uh, can create interference such as harmonics or intermodulation. And what can be useful when you're looking for interference actually is uh, the ability to decode in the case of cellular bands uh, the information on the modulated signal to help you ascertain what the source of that interferer might be. So moving on to the next slide, there are also what we call unmodulated sources of interference. And these are created from electronic devices that unintentionally create RF signals. And these can be separated into two categories. One is continuous noise, and the other one is impulse noise. So starting off with continuous noise, this can be electric motors, electric motors that are on continuously. It can be the ballast and neon lighting. It can also be faulty transmitters, particularly the transformers you might see on the uh, side of a utility pole. Uh, security and infrared cameras, and even vehicle ignition systems. And if you look at the slide on the bottom, or the charts that I have on the bottom, what I have here is a LTE signal. And if you look at the uh, chart on the right-hand side, you can actually see an electric motor raising the noise floor of the whole signal all the way along on the band that I actually see here. So this can have an effect, and a detrimental effect actually on your quality of service by having this whole noise floor operating, uh, a signal operating at a higher level than what you would expect. And moving on to uh, impulse noise from unmodulated sources, and this is caused when the uh, electrical flow is actually turned on and off to the device that's causing the interference. And there are many, uh, many sources of impulse noise, which can include, again, electric motors, such as elevators, which turn on and off when the uh, car is going up and down, from manufacturing plants, from farms that might be operating some equipment during milking time or some other time, electric fences that hold livestock in, can also be caused by welders. Parking gates is another common source. Malfunctioning baby monitors. Another one is uh, wireless speakers. Arcing power lines, particularly when it's damp out or in uh, very high humidity. Light dimmers, lightning suppression devices, commercial uh, baking ovens when they go on and off. And ironically, even the beacons on the top of cell towers can cause interference. Garage door openers and TV remotes. And the list actually goes on and on. There's a lot more devices that can even cause uh, this type of uh, impulse noise, which is very difficult to detect because they're not on all the time. Another source of interference is harmonics. 
and a harmonic is a multiple of the RF carrier, the fundamental frequency. So for example, a 750 megahertz frequency can actually produce harmonics at 1500 megahertz, 2250, and 3000 megahertz. And even these large legal uh, power transmitters, you know, megawatt type uh, TV transmitters can produce a uh, one watt third harmonic. So for example, the TV transmitter at operating at 570 to 585 megahertz, channels 30 to 33, can cause problems on EU to band 4, the AWS uh, uplink, which is 1710 to 1755 megahertz. If this uh, AWS sector is very close to the TV transmitter, so if I'm actually operating my cell phone very close to that TV transmitter, I might be picking up that harmonic, which is going to result in interference causing poor quality of service. And I have another example down here in the charts below. And in this particular case, this is a two-way radio operating at uh, 462.5. And it's actually producing a harmonic at 925 at uh, double the frequency. And in this particular case, if, for example, I have a U.S two-way radio, I take it overseas, and I'm operating in the 900 band, I might be causing interference in that, uh, uh, in that uh, band for a mobile operator that's operating overseas. Another large source of uh, interference are repeaters or bidirectional amplifiers. And these are really malfunctioning uh, cellular repeaters or bidirectional amplifiers which are used to extend the in-building coverage or coverage in areas with marginal coverage. And the interference is caused in the malfunction of these devices or the retransmission of undesirable signals that the BDA actually picks up, amplifies, and then actually amplifies that interferer. So it causes a problem with your mobile network. This is actually a very common source of interference, but it's a very uh, difficult uh, interferer to actually locate. Then there's passive intermodulation. And what's uh, different about passive intermodulation is it's actually uh, two or more signals that combine and they appear as a nonlinear transmitting device. So rather than being some type of harmonic that you might see from let's say a two-way radio or even a, a TV transmitter, they combine in nonlinear ways that cause numerous interferers at any frequency, any possible frequency, from the addition and the subtraction of these fundamental frequencies along with harmonics. And this is called the rusty bolt effect. It uh, typically happens when you have two metal objects that are uh, mating together, causing a rectifier effect when corrosion is present. However, it's not only with corrosion. It can happen if you don't torque connectors properly on the wires going up a cell tower. Uh, it can cause by just dirt and uh, grime getting inside these connectors if they're not actually sealed properly. And as I mentioned before, it generates these spurious signals that are radiated by these connected metal objects. So some of the common sources of passive intermodulation, obviously the rusty bolts, but also fences and even barn roofs. Uh, corroded rooftop air conditioners even ran into a case, ironically, where a uh, store a wireless operator in a uh, storefront had a rusty air conditioner. It was actually causing uh, interference in a competitor's mobile network, uh, you know, unintentionally. As I mentioned also before, improperly connected, uh, untorqued or loose, dirty connectors in the cell tower antenna feed lines. Even the cell tower guy lines can, uh, can cause this, as well as utility poles, wires, or rain gutters. Another source of interference is uh, intentional interference. Often these are located in populated areas, such as shopping malls, restaurants, schools, or military bases. But they can also be uh, in mobile uh, areas, such as cars or trains, and in fact, they, uh, a person down in Florida was operating one of these in his vehicle for almost two years before the FCC finally caught up with them. And they are trying to levy a uh, nearly a $50,000 fine on this person for uh, jamming the uh, mobile network uh, 
It can also be very, very dangerous because in this particular case, he was also blocking 911 calls that people couldn't get through if they had an emergency. And this is why civilian use is illegal. Uh, usually, they are typically easily uh, identifiable uh, because they have a strong, constantly on signal. There's even a case where a uh, school teacher was operating one of these in her classroom in order to prevent uh, her uh, students from texting and calling during class hours. And it usually, usually raises the noise floor quite a bit. And in the uh, example I have below, you can see a, a jammer actually operating in the GSM band of, uh, of 850. It's quite obvious uh, that this is a jammer just like looking at what the uh, signal looks like in the uh, spectrum analyzer. So those are the type of interferers that I actually uh, covered. Uh, now I want to move on to uh, radio propagation. So when we talk about radio propagation, uh, we can pretty much safely say that spectrum is not created equal. Uh, when you're at higher frequencies, and this is just an approximation of 1,700 megahertz, but generally when you're in above 15, 1,700, 2,000 megahertz, your signals are more disposed to be more line of sight and more easily reflected with low penetration into buildings. However, when you get below that, let's say you get below approximately 1,700 megahertz, the radio signal actually tends to bend around objects and buildings, has much better penetration characteristics into structures, and they actually travel much further. So the range at which a interfering signal can be detected is really dependent on two things. It's dependent on both frequency and power. Now to give you an example of this, if you look at the chart on the bottom of the diagram, if I have a 700 megahertz macro cell, it actually can cover the equivalent of what seven to nine uh, cells can cover when you're operating at 2600 megahertz. So the same is true when you have an interferer. If I have a 700 megahertz interferer, one that's operating in that band, it's going to propagate a lot further than one that extinguishes itself a lot quicker if it's at 2600 megahertz. So consequently, uh, what we're finding in the marketplace is that most of the interference hunting is usually occurring at the lower frequencies. Not all, but a majority of it. Typically in your 7, 800, 900 megahertz range. The other difficult thing, or I should say the challenge, really is multipath. And multipath occurs when radio signals from one source reach your receiving antenna, you know, whether it's your uh, cell tower antenna or even your uh, antenna that you're using for interference hunting, when it reaches that antenna via two or more paths. And this is caused by reflections and refractions off of bodies of water or objects, including buildings and mountains. It can even occur by, uh, you know, temporarily by moving vehicles such as a train or a semi-trailer. This is a very, very common uh, condition in urban canyons, such as in downtown areas of cities, and it can very uh, severely affect locating the source of that interferer. So now that we talked about the interference types and we talked about radio propagation, let's actually move into interference hunting. So first, uh, let's talk about the configuration when it comes to interference hunting and some of the ways you want to actually set up when you uh, do interference hunting. You have to decide whether you're going to use a spectrum analyzer or a fast Fourier transform scanner. And some spectrum analyzers are actually FFT-based, some are not. But if the ones that are not FFT-based, uh, they're usually based on a heterodyne swept principle, which means they're usually uh, slow. You may miss information during a sweep, and they typically have lower dynamic range over large frequencies, making it more difficult to be able to find that interferer. And you also have to specify a lot of parameters and settings in order to set it up. Typically with an FFT scanning receiver, it's a more simplified setup, more simplified approach to how you actually set up the scanner in order to hunt for that interferer. And the way you detect the radio signal is based on a fast Fourier transform principle. 
where the sample is digitized and then the FFT is applied. You have a much higher probability of intercept and you have better dynamic range over larger frequencies. Next, you have to decide on what type of antenna you want to use. And there are essentially two types of antennas used in interference hunting. One is a log periodic. The advantage of this is it has a high frequency range over several gigahertz, so it might go from six, seven hundred megahertz all the way up to five, six, seven gigahertz. The disadvantage of it is it's less directional than a Yagi. The other type is a Yagi antenna, which is uh, frequency uh, specific. So what we mean by that, instead of having a large frequency range, it might only have a uh, bandwidth of 50 megahertz at lower frequencies, but at higher frequencies it might be 100, 200, 250 uh, megahertz wide. So the advantage of this is it's more directional than a log periodic, so you get a little better accuracy in finding the direction of where that interferer is coming from. But you have to have a different uh, antenna for every frequency, for every band that you want to test. So both have their advantages and disadvantages. Then next you have to decide how you're going to actually uh, uh, aim, or I should say position your antenna on the device, on your handheld device, when you're actually hunting for interference. You can have horizontal or vertical polarization. And if you look at the charts below, the diagrams, you look at your elevation plot and your azimuth plot, you can see that the vertical polarization, you have much better directionality than what you do with the azimuth. But it really kind of depends upon the interferer that you have. Most interferers, however, are ubiquitous, so they put out radiation in any direction. So consequently, most users employ this vertical polarization of the uh, antenna when you actually place it on your handheld device. However, some users actually turn their antenna 45 degrees to get kind of a combination of directionality between elevation and azimuth that you don't necessarily know uh, what that interferer looks like. And then next you have to be able to locate that interferer. So if you see on this chart here we have a map and if you collect bearings from at least three locations of where that interferer is, you can triangulate the location of that interferer. And if you uh, want to get better accuracy you might want to take more than three locations, maybe take four, five, or six, to be able to actually try to pinpoint where that interferer is to several hundred feet, uh, you know, before you actually uh, get to that location and hunt down the exact uh, location of where that interferer is. Now, the big challenge is uh, locating interferers when you have multipath. So uh, when you have a multipath condition, which is very typical in urban canyons, uh, there's really two ways that, uh, or two techniques, the way that people use to be able to hunt down that interferer. One is to find a good location away from the buildings and the metal objects, such as a building roof, and away from any metal object, including vehicles. However, often this is almost impossible in downtown areas. So another technique that's often used is to actually uh, walk through major intersections when you're walking the streets of a downtown area and then point the antenna in each one of the four directions of that, inter of that intersection. And when you find the actual uh, highest signal, the largest signal in one of those directions, you start going down that street until you hit the next intersection and follow that same procedure until you're convinced that that interferer is in the block that you're actually, uh, uh, where it's actually located. So these are two common techniques for a multipath. Uh, as you can see, it's difficult because of the way uh, that signal can reflect off of uh, various uh, buildings or even metal objects. So with that, a uh, little primer on interference, I'd like to uh, turn this over to my colleague, Chinta Fadia, who's now going to give you some information about our C-Wave interference locating system. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, webinar. So, so far, what we have done is Jim has given us an introduction into what is interference 
the different types of interference or the sources of interference that you can uh, observe in the field, RF propagation and stuff, and how, what are the techniques you can do for interference hunting. So this gives us a very good primer to get into the tool that you can, one of the tools that PSTEL has brought and our latest offering uh, to the market in terms of interference hunting. We call it C-Wave. Uh, it's not an interference locating system which helps you not only identify the frequency that is interfering but also localize the source of interference and physically locate where it is. So what we have done here at PCTEL, as my, quite a few of you might be aware that PCTEL's core uh, RF Solutions core business is in the scanning receivers. The scanning receivers are majorly used for drive test applications or in optimization, planning, baselining applications throughout the network life cycle. So what we recognized is that most of our customers already have scanning receivers. These scanning receivers have spectrum analysis functionality built into them. So why not harness the spectrum analysis functionality within the scanning receivers to combine it with a direction finding system to identify and locate interference. And that's how we created C-Wave. So you, if you look here, the different components of C-Wave are listed on this chart. I'll walk through each one of them. So the first one is the scanning receivers, which could be any of PCTEL scanning receivers from the MX, EX Flex to the latest offering, which is the Serial IB Flex. Uh, it combines then with the host handheld platform. Now this is the heart of the system along with the brain of the system as well because what it does is this host handheld platform combines, connects to the scanning receiver. It has a mount for the tablet so the tablet can be mounted on it. It has a digital compass and an inbuilt GPS receiver built in it and it also has an end type connector where you can connect all, any of the antennas. So the host handle platform then combines with the scanning receiver and the tablet uh, which is mounted on it. This tablet has a windows based touchscreen application for C-Wave uh, for the users to manage it and run with it. You can then combine this with the directional antenna as mentioned by Jim which is one of the antennas that PCTEL provides the log periodic or the Yagi antenna or you can also get any of the off the shelf antennas and combine it with this entire system help you identify the source of interference and locate it. So what are some of the benefits in terms of using C-Wave as compared to anything else? So well, one of the biggest benefits is its ergonomic design. So what we have heard from carriers and the feedback that we have got from the field is that carriers are already running low on resources. They do not have people who, uh, who can go and ident identify interference. They do not have multiple people, do, uh, multiple people doing this. So they need one person to be able to use this entire system and locate the source of interference. So we have, the way we have designed C-Wave, it's very ergonomic. You put the scanner in the backpack along with the battery and, and the, the entire system is in the backpack. You can load it on. And then you hold the handle in one hand, have the tablet mounted on it, and it's a touch screen application. So one person can easily use this so it saves you time and resources can utilize the time more efficiently towards all the other tasks instead of two person trying to identify interference, one holding the spectrum analyzer, one holding the antenna and driving around. So it's a mess but this one will make it very easy for people to identify interference. Another benefit uh, of this product is that it will not only helps you identify internal but also external interference easily with the spectrum analysis functionality built in. One other one, it has a very long battery life. So you don't have to depend in on the spectrum analyzers that you would have used before or which are available in the field that have limited battery life that are heavy to carry around. But this one is light, lightweight, ergonomic and has long battery life. The battery life depends on the tablet battery life which is 4.5 hours typically and on the scanner battery life. The scanner battery life goes from anywhere from four to six hours on the Seagull IB Flex and it also has a hot swappable battery system so you can actually extend the life of the scanner as long as you want. It helps you keep your, keep your costs down and your budgets and budget under control because what happens is you do not need different equipment with this. You have a scanning receiver in the market that you're using for drive testing or benchmarking, optimization, whatever your need be. You can combine the same scanning receiver, just enable 
the, the spectrum analysis functionality on it, and you can combine it with the host handle system, which can be bought from PCTAP, and that does you keep your costs under control. So it becomes very cost effective for users. And as I mentioned before, that's a tablet-based system uh, for the application. Touch screen, very simple, only three or four screens, so it's very easy for any user to start using it and learn it. And it helps you identify the accurate location because of the algorithms that have been built into the application. So combined, it's a very uh, lightweight, easy to use system. Let's dive a little bit into C-Wave and see what are the different types of scans or the charts that are available within C-Wave. So one of the biggest difference of C-Wave uh, is that you can carry out two multiple scans at the same time. You, so if you're looking for an interfering source in both your uplink and downlink bands, you can do that at the same time. So you do not need uh, to do the drive twice or do interference location twice. You can do it in the same time, same uh, application when you're doing it. You also have marker ability on the charts itself, and this is a touch screen, so the marker can be moved wherever you believe the source of interference is. So the blue, blue line that you see is the marker, and this marker, if you touch on it, you can move it to the interfering source, and all the bearings and all the information that you take will be stored for this particular marker and the interfering frequency. You can also change the bandwidth as you keep do doing your data collection. You can change your bandwidth using the green markers on the two sides. So, if one, for example, if you started with a wide band scan and you're scanning the entire band that is available to find the interfering source, once you narrow down, you can move the marker to that frequency and you can also move the green markers from both the sides, from the left and the right hand side, to reduce the bandwidth and do a selected frequency scan. So, in that way, you are able to narrow down quickly and easily towards the interfering frequency. Another capability of these charts is that when you are doing two scans or two simultaneous scans, it gives you the ability to either just keep scanning or store the data independently of each other. So if you're just looking at one scan and you want to store the data from the other scan, you can do that. So it provides you that ability and the data is directly stored on the hard drive of the tablet or you can store it on an SD card if you have that. And in addition to the visual indicators, it has indicators for audio as well which is particularly useful if you are in an inbuilding application. GPS, which is inside the host handle platform, cannot be used indoors. So if you are trying to find the source of interference inside, you can use the audio pitch to find the interfering source. As you get closer to the uh, interference, you will have this pitch going higher. Another chart which is very useful is a spectrogram. So the spectrogram is a waterfall diagram, which is a visual representation in the time scale to see all the frequencies that you have been scanning. What it helps is, uh, and one of the biggest examples that I can give where it's very useful is, if you have an intermittent source of interference that keeps coming up and going off, you can, you can lay down C-Wave in a particular location, start collecting data, collect for three or four hours, and then when uh, you can start your analysis and see when this interfering source is coming up. So using spectrogram, you can actually visualize when the source comes up or goes away. And it also has a legend or color scale, which can help you identify which is a source of interference so that you can easily visualize it and uh, pinpoint it quickly. Some of the features of the spectrum analyzer function that is within the uh, C-Wave system is the pre-amplifier. It comes with a pre-amplifier which amplifies the low power signals by up to 25 dB. It also has an attenuator built in so that you do, you, you do not saturate the scanning receiver. It, uh, it prevents the high power signals from saturating the scanning receiver. As I mentioned before, the host handle platform has a GPS and a digital compass built in. Then uh, in terms of data, your data collection, you can do smaller resolution bandwidths as well as a higher one. So it can go from 2.5 kilohertz to 20 megahertz. So you can change uh, the resolution bandwidth depending on the type of interferer that you are after. Uh, the charts itself have functionalities like max, min, and average hold, which is particularly useful uh, when you're trying to find out what the interfering source is doing over a period of time. Or So if, if you've started your data collection and you want to see where the interfering source has gone minimum or what is the maximum that it has, you can have the maximum or the average hold while you're still 
seeing the yellow line for the current scan. And another advantage or feature with the host or uh, CWEB system is that you don't have to use the antennas that PCTEL has provided. You can, it's a standard intact connector. So in addition to the PCTEL antennas, you can get an off-the-shelf antenna if you want and you can use it with the CWEB system. We now come to the part of how do you localize or how do you physically locate the source of interference. So as Jim mentioned before uh, when during his uh, discussion that you point the antenna towards the source of interference. You can use either polarization, the vertical or the horizontal polarization and try and find the lo locate the direction of the, system, uh, of the interferer. But directional antennas also have focus but relatively wide radiation patterns as he discussed and he showed us. So some users might use the vertical polarizations, some use the horizontal, or as Jim mentioned, some users might use a 45 degree polarization. What we do, in addition to that, we provide two types of modes where you can take a bearing. What I mean by a bearing is that if you feel that a source of interference is right in front of you, the, the handheld host platform has a trigger button on it. So when you are in the uh, map, you can click on the trigger button, what this will do is it takes a bearing, it saves a bearing, the bearing has the following information. It saves the, uh, the power level of the interfering source, it saves the lat long from where you have taken the bearing and with the digital compass it saves the direction in which uh, this interfering source is. So what you have done is manually you have, you have captured the direction in which the source of interference is. What, and now this is one location. You can do this from multiple different locations and you can take multiple bearings pointing you in, into the source of interference. Once you have more than three bearings, you can triangulate and find out where exactly the source of interference is. We say that minimal, you need, uh, minimally you need three bearings to identify the source of interference. Uh, so if you have more than three bearings, you can always use it because it improves your accuracy. But uh, it, you should have at least three. Now another way of the identifying this location is using an automatic mode which we have in C-Wave. What you do in automatic mode is that if you know that uh, it's, the source of interference is in a particular direction, you point the antenna in that direction, you press and hold the trigger button and then you lateral, uh, laterally move this antenna in 60 degrees to the left and to the right. What it essentially does is it keeps tracking the source of interference and the power level and in the entire semicircle that you move it left and right, it will find out which is the uh, location where the interfering source has the highest power level and it will take a bearing for you in that direction. So with the automatic mode, you are removing some chances that a user error might occur in a particular direction or in the manual mode and you're using the algorithm built in to find out exactly what is the location where the interfering source has the highest power and take the direction from that. So these two modes combined, you can take bearings and you can then combine the bearings to triangulate the location. So what we do in C-Wave, you, you can look at all the bearings. So if you look here, the three red lines are the three different directions in which the bearings were taken. And once the user triangulates, you can see the red dot in between, which kind of shows, shows where the source of interference is. So it shows you on the map easily where your source of interference is and you can go and then locate it. On the right hand side what you see is all the bearing information that you've collected. So you can then select, deselect bearings that you want and use them for triangulation. The digital compass also keeps showing the direction as you're collecting the bearings. What we also allow with, to make your task easier what we also allow is uh, we also allow users to load in network configuration files onto the map itself, which makes it easier because if you know that a source of interference is coming from a particular sec sector of a site, then you know in what direction you have to look for and you can easily identify that. So it helps, helps users easily look at the source of interference. With that said, I'll hand it over back to Jim uh, to conclude our webinar because this was my introduction to C-Wave. Uh, if you have further questions, you can always get in touch with us on the product itself. I'll have Jim conclude the webinar. Hey, thank you, Chintan. Uh, just a couple slides here uh, to talk about really how uh, interference actually affects the network. 
So uh, recently, back in February, there was a lot of press about uh, Verizon 700 megahertz LTE cell sites was being victimized by an interferer from fluorescent lights. And this is actually coming from a, uh, a new building where, uh, with, from the fluorescent lighting inside that building actually taking down the uh, cell site. And from my understanding now, they're under orders actually to be able to uh, change the uh, ballast in all of these uh, fluorescent lights in order to prevent this uh, interferer from affecting the uh, Verizon network. Another case that was in the press actually just recently was from uh, December of uh, last year, and this was again uh, an interferer uh, uh, actually causing Time Warner was experiencing this uh, because they didn't actually properly shield their boxes and their uh, cable system from the, uh, from the mobile network. So uh, these, kings, these interferers can actually have very severe effects and consequences on the network, and it's uh, very important that uh, interference uh, is continually controlled, managed, and also uh, watched for in order to be able to provide this good quality of service in your mobile network. So to summarize uh, what we talked about today, uh, I think it's safe to say that interference can be a significant source of customer data satis dissatisfaction of the mobile network. Uh, the other thing about uh, interference, external interference, is that uh, because LTE networks actually operate at lower signal levels than 2G and 3G networks, an interferer that uh, might not affect a 2 or 3G net network as much because it has uh, lower power might actually affect an LTE E network a little more uh, as opposed to these other technologies. And the other uh, conclusion that we're trying to make here is that interference hunting is an ongoing process. Uh, new interferers are continually created. And in fact, one of the uh, tier one carriers in the U.S. actually just formed a nationwide interference hunting group to be able to track interference nationwide uh, because it has such a detrimental effect on their, uh, on their network. So with that, uh, I want to start going through questions. I want to thank you all for attending. And uh, what we have shown here in this last chart uh, is that we have LTE posters. We have an LTE physical layer poster, an LTE MIMO poster, and an LTE advanced poster. If you're interested in obtaining one of these, you can either register on our website and download a poster or you can actually put in your address and we'll uh, send you uh, a combination of these three posters uh, uh, right to your address. So, so uh, thank you, Jim. We have quite a few questions that have come in. Uh, the first question, and we'll try to answer all of that or as, much, as many as we can. The first question that has come in is, what is the frequency range that CWIP can test? So the frequency range that uh, C-Wave can test is uh, actually based on the scanner that you have. So if you have a fixed band scanner, uh, it'll be limited to what those fixed bands are in that scanner. If you have one of our flex scanners, like an EX flex or an IB flex, uh, those are sold either with a super band, all the frequencies in them, or with fixed bands. And you can have those upgraded to go to a super band which will cover the full frequency range of, uh, of the scanner. So for the uh, EX Flex, that range is 150 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz. For the IB Flex, it's 570 megahertz to 3.8 uh, gigahertz, which covers pretty much all the cellular bands uh, in the world. <laughs> Another one that we have in continuation with that is, can you test uplink and downlink at the same time for spectrum theory? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, with C-Wave, you have the ability to actually start two scans at the same time. So uh, in order to save uh, time and be efficient when you're uh, hunting down interference for spectrum uh, clearing, you can actually uh, do a scan for the downlink and do another scan for the uplink and uh, try to hunt down these interferers all in one drive test. Another one that we have is, do we need to have uplink bands on scanner to operate with C-Wave? Example, what is needed to make existing EX scanner to work in C-Wave C system? If you want to test the uplink in service, uh, then yes, you would need the uplink fixed band uh, in that scanner to be able to test it. And uh, 
if since it's a fixed band scanner, if uh, if it's full, we do have a uh, an upgrade program where we can go to an EX Flex, which would uh, be able to uh, allow you to get all those uplinks uh, in a EX Flex scanner at a at a low cost compared to trying to buy a new scanner. Another one that we have is what is the sensitivity of C wave? How can we capture interference near noise level? Yeah, this is really dependent on the uh, on, on the uh, on the scanner itself. So uh, the inter uh, yeah, when it comes to sensitivity, uh, it really depends upon the resolution bandwidth that you have. So depending upon the resolution bandwidth, it's uh, in setting that you have in there, it's anywhere from roughly in the minus, uh, you know, 108, minus 110, uh, all the way up to minus, or I should say down to minus 120, 125, depending upon what your resolution bandwidth setting is, and that's in uh, dB. Thank you. Uh, next question. Can you record and playback sessions in Seaway for future analysis? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, we have the ability to uh, record all the data. So uh, if you don't necessarily uh, want to be able to try to analyze this in real time, uh, you can actually take back all the data that you collected, uh, play it back so a lot of your uh, colleagues can look at it at the same time to actually try to hunt down where that uh, interferer might be and what type of interferer it might be. Uh, another one, I can answer this one probably. Uh, if I have several C waves positioned in different locations, can I combine bearings from them to triangulate where the interferer is? Yes. Uh, so if you collect data using def multiple sessions, you can, uh, within C wave, combine the bearings from multiple sessions, import them into a single session, and use them to triangulate. We leave it to the user what they want to combine as and want, uh, and uh, leave it to their discretion that it should be the same frequency that you're combining. But yes, if you want, you can combine all the bearings into a single session and use it later on. Another one, probably Jim, for you, this one is, what is the accuracy of the bearing? And can I select which bearings are used for triangulation? Uh, yes, you can uh, actually select which bearings uh, that you want to use for triangulation. So if you have an outlier and you don't want to use that, uh, you, don't, you uh, don't select that one in your triangulation calculation. And the accuracy uh, is what we're, uh, what we have is uh, uh, five degrees is uh, what the uh, typical accuracy of the uh, bearing is. But again, it is dependent upon where you actually pull the trigger when you uh, actually select what your bearing is. Uh, and when you actually do the automated method that Chintana talked about, it will be a little more accurate uh, since uh, the calculation is actually automated. Uh, based on what the antenna sees, but as you know, there's fading that can occur and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, accuracy in general is in the neighborhood of five degrees. Another question that has come in is: Is C Wave available uh, only for Windows, or can it be combined with Android or iOS? Right now, C Wave is only available on Windows uh, as a touchscreen application. We are considering Android for future. I think we have one more. What are the other machines that you can use uh, C-Wave on? And I think what the user is asking here, if I'm right, is that if you collect the data on a tablet, can you put it on a laptop or somewhere else? Yes, you can do that. What you can do is you can collect the data using a tablet. We have a free playback version of the C-Wave, uh, which you can install on your laptop to analyze the data that you've collected so you can easily go through it. Uh, Jim, this one probably you can answer. If I use off-the-shelf antenna, can I put in the gain? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, in our uh, configuration or on the uh, last uh, actual screen that we have on the uh, C-Wave product, uh, you can actually select whatever uh, gain you have for that particular antenna. So if you're uh, using an off-the-shelf antenna, let's say you might get a Yagi that with a type N connector from someone else, you can actually put in the uh, gain uh, for that particular antenna. I think I can take the next one. Uh, what are the type of maps that are used in C-Wave and how can I get them? So C-Wave uses the open street maps which are free and easily available and we, would, we also provide a tool for users to download those maps so the 
users can then use that tool to download the maps and load it into SeaWave. Another one, Jim, probably you can answer this. What are the advantages of SeaWave over a traditional spectrum analyzer? Yeah, I uh, mentioned that a little bit uh, before, but uh, to go into a little more detail, I think uh, one is the uh, commercial aspect of it, where you can use an existing scanner, provided it has the bands that you're already interested in. And if you don't have those bands, uh, we do have upgrade programs or flex scanners that allow you to be able to get the uplinks if you need those. Uh, the other one is the ergonomics. Uh, the fact that you have uh, one hand that holds both the uh, antenna itself, which includes the uh, tablet computer, and the other hand is free to be able to uh, save your data points, to be able to uh, set up the scans and uh, do what other uh, type of uh, parameters that you need to set when you're actually doing the interference hunting. I guess the third one is that it's based on an FFT scanner versus a, uh, a hedrodyne uh, spectrum analyzer if you have that type, which would be uh, have better dynamic range and accuracy uh, over a uh, more traditional uh, heterodyne spectrum analyzer. Another question that has come in is, can I use non-PCTEL scanners on C-Wave? Uh, no, not at this time. Uh, right now it uh, has to operate with the PCTEL scanner. Can be either the uh, ID Flex, the EX family, including EX Flex or the MX scanners. Doesn't really operate with uh, third-party uh, devices. The next one we have is: Do you have des destination built in into the compass? I think he means uh, declination. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, uh, because uh, these uh, can be used all over the world, uh, you really need to put the declination in to get the accuracy uh, for the bearing. So uh, as you all probably know that uh, magnetic north is not really uh, true north. It's not uh, where the North Pole is actually uh, at. It's about a thousand miles away. And depending upon where you are in the world, uh, your uh, true north uh, measurement can be off 10, 15 degrees, maybe only 5 degrees, but anyway, you can put that declination in to be able to get the accuracy of your bearing uh, when you're actually doing the uh, interference hunting on the map. So I think we can take one more, and probably this will be the last one. Um, when is SeaWave available? Uh, SeaWave is available uh, at the end of this uh, month which is the end of this week, actually. So uh, yeah, it's, it's essentially available now. You can start taking orders uh, currently. And uh, uh, we uh, hope you have pleasant uh, interference hunting with it. <laughs> so with that, uh, we'd like to conclude today's webinar. We thank everyone for joining in. And if you still have any further questions, please get in touch with our sales or us. Uh,